I'm Stephen Foskett, the organizer of the Tech Field Day event series. What you're about to watch is a presentation from Tech Field Day Live at NetApp Insight. Tech Field Day is an event where we bring independent writers, speakers, bloggers, podcasters together with companies in their space to ask questions, interact, discuss, and of course, to learn about new technology. If you'd like to learn more, you can come to techfieldday.com and you can see a lot of videos like this at youtube.com slash techfieldday. Thanks for watching. So we're going to talk really about uh, what I see as kind of the state of where things are going. I spend a lot of time interacting with a lot of very interesting customers. I'm kind of focused on the top global 100 customers right now that NetApp engages with. And um, a lot of the stuff that I'm doing is just not things I've done in the past. I've worked for very small organizations. You know, I was the old sole IT guy at a number of companies as when I was on the other side of the, of the table here. Back in, what, 2011 when I was looking to become a delegate at Tech Field Day. <laughs> And I took a job with Emulex selling HBA adapters, and then I didn't get to go. So I like this because um, they airbrushed my face. Thank you, Ashley McNamara. I love this picture. <laughs> um, so I'm the principal architect uh, in the office of the CTO. You just saw my buddy, Jeremiah. He's my partner in crime. Batman, Robin, whatever you want to call it. I don't know which one's Batman. Little spoon, big spoon. You You're make Robin. any reference you want. Yeah, I'm Robin. Yeah, he's definitely better at this stuff than I am. Um, so stock me, do all those things if you want. I've been doing this for a while. I've worked for a lot of different organizations. I really like and enjoy getting out and talking to people. Right? That's kind of what I do for a living. And I like to start off with brevity. So you know, think about this. There really are no bad, truly bad ideas. And um, you know, this is, I liked this one, and I saw this on Twitter, and I stole it. And I said, you know, once somebody in a meeting said, hey, let's make a tornado full of sharks movie. And gosh, what are they on, the third or fourth one right now? I just like the, the subtitle for the fourth one, oh, for the third one, oh, hell no, because that's how I feel about the whole series of movies. Exactly, right? All right, so let's talk about disruption, uh, especially digital disruption, right? So here's Steve Jobs. It's 2007. He's holding up the new iPhone, right? And there's a discussion between the two CEOs of BlackBerry, like RIM, RIM Technologies up in Canada. Hey, check it out, dude. Well, they're really good. Looks really slick. Hey, first iPhone was kind of a pretty big deal. And then there's guys, like, hey, we're going to be fine. There's no issues there. Come on. We're BlackBerry. We own the market. We're not fine. Was that second guy Don Basile? Yeah. Yes. Lazaridis and Basile. Names I can't pronounce because they're French. But they are not fine, right? What did they announce uh, just the other day? They no longer actually make the BlackBerry handset. I mean, are you kidding me? Today. today. Done. Done. This is actually, I mean, this is somewhat old data, but, you know, I think their market cap's like sub 2 billion. At one point, it was like 75 billion. They had such a massive share of the market. They were the de facto route to market for messaging in the corporate world. I had every single BlackBerry, every single one. From the pager all the way up till I got an iPhone 4, I think, in 2012. And that's when I made the transition to like, you know, but the reason why is because they didn't fail because it was bad technology or a bad form factor or anything like that. You may ever try to download and work with their app store. Yeah. The app store, you had to download an application to open the app store. And when you could open the app store, there were no apps on it, right? Because everybody was making this transition from you know, I work on my computer, my desktop, oh, I got a laptop and run around with that. No, now I'm doing it on a tablet or a handheld. Okay, how did I get here? I, I just gave this presentation in Vail, so this was how I took the screenshots from the various tools I used to get to the location I was. I used, you know, my, my app for phones, my car rental app, my hotel app. I'm going to Amsterdam next week, it's gonna be fun. Um, you know, that's the same for a lot of people. Think about how many things you do on your phone. Think about things like Pokemon Go, surpassing Twitter in seven days of activity. Right? That's true. But the reality is, is things can come and go that get crazy, oh, yeah. that require scale, that require a new route to market, that require a very different approach to how you leverage and reuse assets. It's the fact that almost everything we do on a daily basis involves my phone. I don't, you know, my laptop's sitting in my room. I don't need my laptop. I have my phone for almost everything I need, other than the fact that I had to use a USB stick to do this. But you know, this is like catnip to develop you know, to advertisers. Forty-three minutes a day. I mean, in the very beginning, that's crazy. I mean, it was a phenomenon. Four and a half million dollars in revenue in the first day. 
35 million in two weeks, 75 million downloads in the first three weeks. Dude, that's crazy. And not everybody's gonna build an app that does this. But in the context of the size of their organizations, they may look at Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A came out with an app that they basically gave away the, co you know, the cogs of a, what's the cogs of a chicken sandwich? 50 cents? But then the number two app on, on, on uh, the app store. It's just because we're all in download. That's true. So when I ask people, hey, what's on your device, right? And it's all this different type of applications from not only shipping, entertainment, banking, some, all my stock, everything I do, almost everything I do has an app, right? I counted up, I had 155 apps. The other day I gave this presentation, I asked a customer, it was a financial institution, I'm like, all right, count up your apps. The guy's like, I have 608. And I'm like, you have a problem. Please give me your phone, just come on, run away. And, and organizations are trying to match this pace of things, right? They're trying to get to this spot where, oh gosh, you know, we see the pace of things in, in this digital world, which is very real to a lot of organizations. Not everybody has apps, not everybody builds apps and delivers them, and I totally understand that. It's this, but this is where I see a bulk, a majority of my time that I spend in front of customers. And when I was building, you know, I did stuff at Toshiba for like seven years, right? And when I was building and, and developing the storage and virtualization architecture with inside that organization, I was following this exact ladder step. Standardize on servers, consolidate, virtualize, do all of that stuff. All right, and then we got to a point where we said to go out there and do automation orchestration. That's where it started to get hot and heavy, right? When you get from 10 virtual machines to 200 virtual machines, you really have to start investigating and, and doing that work up front. But this is the legacy world. And then there's a new world out there where things are being focused on that is very much engaged in that DevOps mindset. And this is definitely not every customer, every company out there. There's certain verticals like healthcare where this is a struggle to resonate with, but there's a lot more of those companies that are looking at this approach than not. And it looks more like this. They're at a turning point, right? They just followed this stepladder point, right? They virtualized, they got everything up and running. They wanna to get to this kind of cloud first cloud native implementation aspect, most of them are stuck right in the middle. They're working on implementing policy-driven automation, they're working on how do I, how do, I do Amazon in-house, right? On-premise this, because that's the word, prem, clowns. <laughs> yeah, um, it's easy, you just rewrite all your applications, including the one right. that you Right, and that's the reality. The guy that wrote like, it died. Going from here to here, there's not, like a, there's not like a magic pill, there's no hyperloop, there's no, you know, pixie dust, there's no teleporter. The vast majority, the, the reality is, is that the vast majority of customers or people that are out there that have entrenched IT organizations are still gonna do all the stuff on the left hand side, but I would encourage them to look at doing all the new things on the right hand side. Because I'm not gonna exchange in a container, you know, I'm not gonna, you know, you know Oracle, you know, let's, let's go forward. Oracle runs in the background, it doesn't run on my phone. Right? And these systems don't run on your phone. But these other types of technologies that are more platform three or mode two operational, they power all the stuff that runs on my phone for the most part. You know, think about Amazon. Amazon ran on Oracle to what, 2000? 99 or 2000? And then they had to change things significantly because they realized that, hey, we just can't scale. We can't meet the needs of a customer. We can't meet the needs of the uh, technologies that we want to deliver and uh, develop and deliver. Right? But things like social media, you know, mobile analytics and cloud, those technologies that are very much in part of how a, a good number of organizations on this planet generate their revenue, those are the things that matter. And they use a completely different set of tools. Right? Yeah, but they also don't require strict consistency. Sometimes. So here's some analysty stuff, right? Facebook's accounting department still runs Oracle. Sure, yeah, <laughs> they do. But at some point they won't. I mean, I, gosh, I, I, I hate the fact that I have to use Oracle eye expense. Oh, no, I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm just referring to the database right. engine. Right, right, yeah. No, I the get application it. stuff. And I get it, and I, like, I said, I, like I said, you're gonna have very defined technologies that are simply not gonna translate to that next gen space, right? But there's a whole bunch of stuff out there that I continue to run into, like, dude, bare metal's making a comeback. Yeah. I tweeted that out the other day, it totally is, right? And it's like, everything's a cycle, everything's a circle. Right, and we get to this poise, the, the, the things that are important to a mode one versus a mode two customer are very different. It's sprinter versus marathon. 
You know, that transition from first platform to third platform is very interesting to a lot of organizations because there's efficiencies to gain as you go up the stack. Heck, mainframe's still what, 2.7 billion, 2.4 billion dollar business for IBM, and they own it, you know? And, but it, the, and, it's, not, and it's never going away. It's never gonna go away. Just like tires for your car are probably never gonna go away. You know, there are certain things that you're just gonna, they're always gonna be here, right? It's a good uh, transition point because Joe just told you, you know, about all this cloudy stuff that we're working on, right? By 2020, some people are saying, you know, one third of all data will pass through the cloud at some point. We were at what, VMworld a couple weeks back? Yeah. What did Pat go up there and say? 20, you know, 14 years from now, half of everything's gonna be running the cloud? That's pretty ambitious. It could be possible, I don't know yet. But, you know, we reinforce the fact that there is no cloud, it's just somebody else's computer. I mean, that, that's the good joke that runs around. Transition to cloud computing is definitely upon us though, right? Because there's operational efficiencies that we get by taking on that model that allow us to do better, <coughs> do more, do it faster, right? Fail faster, provision faster. It sometimes can be simpler. You know, everything needs to go virtual for the most part. Now, like I said, I just said bare metals make it a comeback. There's a different class of customers out there that do a very different set of things. Right, and that's not everybody. You know, not everyone's Facebook, not everybody's Google, you know, Twitter of that nature. But there's others that you know want to mimic those operational efficiencies. And cloud computing, for the most part, allows them to do so. I can't tell you this in 2007 because in 2007, when I was talking and looking into cloud technologies, yeah, no way in hell. But today, I would say that it's a fairly well-established medium of consumption, right? But it doesn't have, you know, there's public cloud's the bomb for a lot of customers, but it doesn't not have challenges, right? That's Netflix's AWS bill, which is 700 million line items, which I believe if you printed out would circle the earth like three or four times, right? That's pretty creepy and scary. That's gigantic. I, I can't even fathom what 700 million line item bill must look like. How do you audit that? No, you don't, you just pay the bill. And I talk to customers all the time that have, you know, anything from a $4,500 a month Amazon bill to customers that have four and five million dollar a month Amazon bills, right? It can get out of control pretty quick. You swipe that card, it's the first hit's free, baby. You know, now you're hooked. Well, you would think by three million dollars I'd hit my credit limit. <laughs> <laughs> so DevOps, right? We're gonna talk some DevOps. Um, I was just in uh, Newport Beach the other week. I, was, I get to follow Gene Kim, right? How awesome is that? I get to go follow like, you know, the guy who wrote the Phoenix Project. Um, <laughs> and give a DevOps-based focused presentation, but it is a very hot topic right now, and that's the book you need to go out and read, and you gotta read the new Kingmakers, and there's a bunch of podcasts that are out there, like Goat Farm and others, and, and, and Arrested DevOps. There's all this stuff that I've, you know, over the last two, three years, I've really tried to dive into from a standpoint of understanding where the direction of things are going, right? Because third platform or cloud, it, you, you can't do it without it, right? It's just not gonna work very well. And you know, these are the people that I wanna go out and talk to. I don't sell technology to storage people anymore because they invariably are not making the decisions, right? And I work for a storage company, how weird is that? Well, 5% of the IT team is what, the storage guys? 95% of the people who have influence in decision-making process in the organization are not. So why not go where those people live? And the thing is, the areas of focus that are important to organizations with stronger or larger developer teams are completely different than the things that are important or interesting to us who have built and worked in the infrastructure world. They really don't care, right? Most of them, you know, they've been using Amazon for years. Think about the kids that are coming out of school today. You think they're learning Fortran and COBOL? Heck, they're not even learning C Sharp. They're working with Golang and Swift and all, you know, that type of stuff, right? So I'm gonna give uh, Josh Atwell some props here because he's made these, a couple of these slides for us. Um, you know, what is DevOps? It's the integration between the two developers and operational teams that are out there, right? You know, at the most part, it's been pretty meh. You know, it has been kind of a, you know, it's, it's a concept. I can't go to the store and buy like, you know, 50 rounds of DevOps. You know, it just, that just doesn't work that way. It's just, it's a operational model that allows you to make some very interesting changes and challenges within your organization to facilitate that traditional or the, the current based continuous integration, continuous delivery lifecycle management, man. ITIL, no, these guys will never do that stuff. You know, really what they're looking for is a, a really rich set of APIs to do all their work through. 
You know, you just heard the talk about putting uh, APIs into AltaVault. It is, it's pretty tough and time consuming to take a platform or a product that had no API implementation process and bake it in after the fact. The analogy I would traditionally use for this is, is if you bake a cake, right, and you forget an egg, and I stole this from Jesse, um, <laughs> if, you, if you bake a cake and you forget an egg and try to put the egg in the cake after the fact, it's not, an, it's not a cake that anyone wants to eat, right? And it very well can be the same for things that are bolted on after the fact. It wasn't inherent in the product. Solid fire, the product I, I, I go forth and sell because I carry a red lightsaber. You know what? Our first three iterations of the product didn't even have a GUI. Our customers didn't want one. They didn't need one. They wanted the, basically the code level integration points, the API calls to initiate the three things that were important to them. How big, how fast, and, how, and, and who can access it, right? And so for us, in many cases, the developers are new consumers of resources in technology, and they don't have a lot of chops when it comes to understanding you know, what the infrastructure really can do because they've never really had to worry about that. And because they don't worry about it, we have to make it so it integrates with how they process information and deliver information, right? Phases of DevOps, they plan, they dev, they test, they release, they monitor and learn, and it's a cycle, right? And when Gene was giving his presentation, he was talking about, you know, people that were doing CI development, you know, and, and doing 10 commits a day as being like the pinnacle of implementation. And then he puts a slide up afterwards that shows, yeah, this customer is doing 143,000 actual production level code commits per day. Dude, I can't even grasp that in my mind, right? Because we look at how things like 12-factor apps and the backend services to leverage it and the tool sets that these customers use to build and develop these processes are very different, right? There's a different world that these people live in that those of us who have played in the infrastructure space for a long time are like, what the hell? I don't even, I can't even begin to comprehend that. Because if you look at how their workflow looks and the tool sets that they leverage and use, there's a bunch of stuff on here you know, a lot of us have never even talked to, never looked at, don't even comprehend. Jenkins, what, he's a butler? Is any butler? He looks like a butler. But I give this talk to a lot of organizations that are in the process of identifying how they're going to make this, this leap in this journey. Right? And so for them, a lot of this stuff's completely new as well. Go to ZBA Labs. Go to the periodic table of DevOps. This is an amazing website and resource for those of you who are just getting your feet wet. Because if you click the mouse over any of those, it breaks the product out. It tells you the space that it lives in. It's a very interesting concept. And you know, obviously, I like it being SolidFire because we're based on the periodic table of elements in our software releases. <laughs> right? But this is a really cool living document that you can go to take a look at. I suggest I, everybody, I, every one time I give this talk or every time I go out and see somebody, I say, go check this out because you will learn a lot about a space that's probably pretty new to most of you, right? Container ecosystem, obviously a very hot topic, right? You think DevOps is hot, containers is even hotter for the most part, and it's starting to mature and get better, you know, bigger. When I went and saw Docker, so I gave, you know, we do tech, tech talks at, uh, um, at all the conferences and whatever. I did. Um, I did one on hyper-converged infrastructure in the OpenStack space at the Atlanta OpenStack Summit in 2014. All right, room probably one-fifth the size of this room. I had like 15 people in there, right? Nobody cared. But the Docker guy came in afterwards, and it was standing room only, and there were people just stacked up out the back door. And I'm like, what the hell is this Docker stuff, right? And then I, Donnie Burkholz put this together and showed me, oh, yeah, people are really interested in Docker. You think? 5X in one year for adoption? Dabbling, abandoned, or adopted? This is even better. Hey, look, between 2014 and 2015, 18,000%. Dude, that's, that's legit. That's legit. That's not where smoke, that's an actual sea change event that's happening. And if you want a new job, these guys are going to get hired left and right, you know? And then we get even crazier. We look at stuff like serverless. You know, so who remembers the, uh, the, the census tool that they were doing down in Australia that took them a year to build and $10 million and it didn't work worth a crap? It didn't, work at all. didn't work at all, right? Two kids at uni spent 500 bucks and build it and get it up and running in 54 hours. They should give those kids the $10 million. They really should, they earned it, right? But they showed you what was capable of this process and you know, this is a very different 
focus and natural evolution of certain types of things. <coughs> Monolithic development might as well be dead, at least in my viewpoint. I don't want to go and, and, and work in areas where they're still using waterfall development. It very much applies to certain types of process. Think about medical devices, right? You do med you're going to do that because those are not applications. They are very structured, very rigid. They have processes. They have a lot of regulation about it. In those areas, it makes it impossible for the most part to kind of move or shift into a DevOps space focus. Right? But if we look at what we're doing with microservices and scalability, right, that's, this should be the new normal for a lot of organizations that are doing heavy development work or designing new applications. Or if you're going to put something out like Pokemon Go or whatever the thousands of apps that the guy had on his phone. You know? But it's not without its challenges. The first version of everything is janky. Don't fear jankiness. Right? Because you're going to go from that to that at some point. And we're, st we're at that point where we're kind of, we're getting on Iron Man 2 and 3 and 4 in some of these areas. You look at OpenStack, if I go back to OpenStack in 2011, it's so janky. Today, it's legit, right? If I go to Amazon in 2001, pretty janky, right? If I go to Amazon today, well, look at how they do it now. That's Oracle. That's the stuff they use today. This puts into perspective, for me at least, when I talk to customers, what does it look like if I'm developing something that has a go-to-market process that integrates a lot of different aspects and underlying technologies? Yep, but notice the financial transactions are still going to a conventional database. Well, it's somewhat conventional. I'd... Got it. You're always going to keep me honest, Howard. Like <laughs> I said, going forward, they can't do one click with some of those things. They had to break it out into the natural components and tools, the leverage, to give themselves a competitive advantage. Now, not everybody's Amazon, no, nah. you know, we, we know that, right? But the reality is you can mimic what they do. That's why open source is so hot right now in a lot of large organizations I go talk to, because you're in control of your own destiny. But the flip side to open source is, hey, open source is free as long as your time is worth nothing, right? For some organizations, they have enough people on staff that the time isn't a big factor. It's a sunk cost. They don't care. Go develop something. Go talk I've to the guys at J.P. Morgan Chase. those Shade. IT departments. Scott, you ever been in one of those IT departments? Those aren't IT departments. That's really what it boils down to. But they have direct purchasing influence and decision-making process. And they, you know what, the developers have won in terms, in, in many organizations, the keys to budget and what gets purchased or picked up. And if you can go out and have a good discussion with them, if you can go and say, hey, what's the relevance of storage in your DevOps world or your cloud world, well, then there you go. Because the struggle is real, right? Love wrap references. Because, you know, you've got a bunch of different stacks. You have, hey, can I migrate data between these? Look at what we're going to look to do with the, you know, data fabric, you know? Multiplicity of hardware environments. I mean, all the challenges that we've all faced for a decade. You know, and the reality is, is public cloud is putting a lot of pressure on traditional IT infrastructure teams to adopt those modes of operation. If I could do Amazon in-house, why not? <clears throat> Where's my self-service provisioning portal? Why can't I spin up you know, 50 instances in 22 minutes? I can go swipe a credit card and do it. I should be able to do it inside. And you go talk, when I go talk to the C-level people and organizations, that's what they're getting the pressure points on. They're not saying, oh, hey, can we do, you know, let's apply Six Sigma to our IT flow. Child, please. Um, you know, consumption models, and I'm sure you guys have seen this before, and I don't want to turn this into a giant solid fire commercial, and I won't. But, you know, there's a lot of different routes of consumption for technologies and resources and infrastructure in the data center. And it's really hard to address all of these with a single product, let alone these individual spaces. When we were solid fire by ourselves with 413 people pre-acquisition. How many IT people did we have? We had one. The guy who imaged the laptops and set the ACLs for the network, right? And even then, he didn't do all that much. I mean, don't get me wrong. You know, not everybody can go completely as a service, right? But the SMB space or a startup, it's very, very attractive. Google Docs, Salesforce, you know, you know all the different uh, online as a services, right? And then you get into some more mature organizations and converged infrastructure, hyper-converged infrastructure is a very attractive approach because it's taking a stack of technology and commoditized hardware and delivering it, or best-of-breed appliances, and putting them together and packaging them in a way that is easy to consume. 
But obviously, you know, most things that we buy still today are best of breed appliances. And then there's these crazy ass guys that are doing, you know, commodity software, commodity hardware, and building their own. And what these organizations are looking for in terms of different aspects is, you know, hey, if, if I'm Twitter, I want, you know, I don't, I don't want any vendor lock in, I'm, gonna, I'm rolling my own, I'm gonna go to you know, Inspur and buy a $400 box and that's gonna be the node that we all use and it's good. it doesn't have a RAID card, it doesn't have two power supplies, <laughs> they don't care. But then on the flip side, you get organizations that are very much care. And when I look at what Solid Fire does, right, I have different areas and a common code base across all of them that address each one of those in these different routes of consumption. Because I think that that's important to build something that gives customers choice in how they want to implement, or as they make that transition and that journey towards the cloud side, right? So fueled by FlexPod as a service, Element X, our software defined aspect, which is very, like I'll say, it's very interesting discussion point because a lot of people want that. That's not something you download and play with. That's a partnership integration aspect. Because needs of organizations you know, I get people all the day long that are slow and want to see incremental small change. And what they value and what they desire is very different from the people who are bleeding and cutting edge. And you have these competing interests with inside almost every IT organization, right? I got people that are, you know what? We're not gonna, we're gonna say six revisions behind on the, the Cisco code base because we don't wanna touch it. We don't wanna break anything, right? And you get other guys like, hey, I'm downloading NSX and I'm gonna put that on and that's gonna be our de facto route to market. Thank you, VMware, you just gotta plug. Um, I look at what I do when I talk, when I go out and, and, and work with organizations is I don't sell flash because like, like I said, I mean, you heard most of us at Solid Fire say this, the hardware is the least compelling piece of the technology, right? It should not matter. You should be able to go, you should be able, the, the hard drives, the SSDs inside your systems, I mean, for us, it's the same stuff you can go down to Fry's and buy, right? It's commodity off the shelf resources. We buy a lot more of them so we get a better price. And we pass that on to customers, right? I want to sell storage services to an organization to address the opportunities that digital or IoT or VR, you know, the, all of these cutting edge uh, things that are happening, this shift or this transition, I want to address those as a service because that's what Amazon's doing. And if you look at a product and how it's brought to market, you know, you start selling, you get better, right? You get to peak functionality. At some point, you're going to get to a level or an area where it doesn't matter how much more crap you put in the box, it's just not gonna be that much more compelling. Or what we're seeing today, HCI buyers look at that and go, that's way too complex. How many permutational changes are in you know, some products that I've seen out there, 40, 50,000, it can get pretty complex. All those nerd knobs, and I get it, some people like that, right? But other people don't give a rat's ass. DevOps people don't care, right? I, you know, if you look at our founder, you listen to Dave Wright, you've seen him say this, I, I still, you know, we build a storage product for people who don't care about storage, and there are a whole bunch of storage products out there for people who care very deeply about storage. The thing is, that's 5% of my addressable customer space, and the other is 95. So, we can skip this part, because you guys have seen the solid fire pitch before a thousand times, you know. Scale out, shared nothing, distributed storage architecture that scales from four nodes to a hundred, you know, and all the speeds and fees aspects of it. We're a block storage. I sell block storage services for the data, you know, next generation data center or next generation constructs. Not to say that I cannot facilitate and leverage solid fire technologies in those traditional environments, and very many of our customers do. But if I go look at my opportunity, you know, if I look at my dashboard right now inside Salesforce, 50% of my opportunities are OpenStack based, right? That's significant, but those 50? are 50, 50% 50 of the customers I engage with on a daily basis are doing something around OpenStack or building private clouds internally, or they're looking at Docker or some kind of integration like that. The, the reality for what I see on a daily basis, and it's very different than everybody else. I mean, I, I have a very select area of focus, right? Large implementations, the top 100 global customers. Um, that's what I see, and that's, you know, that's interesting to me, that it's getting to that level of maturity. Now we see containerization as a means in some organizations to kind of supplant something like OpenStack, but you see more predominantly a merging of those two technologies. And that's what I consider next generation data center processes. And when I look at what SolidFire was built and designed to do, 
it was to address that set of customers who have a very different set of needs. Multi-tenancy, scale out, capacity on demand, automation, self-service. Those are the important aspects to a customer who's trying to build that. And there are very few storage products that actually go out and do it, right? I mean, that's why we get in, we get in early on these technologies, right? We had a native Docker plugin that addresses all of the NetApp backend. That's pretty bitchin', right? For those people who already have NetApp on the floor and you want to go out and play with Docker, you can turn this on right now and use it, right? Well, you go just to, to be able to say we're a portfolio company with multiple platforms but one driver. It's pretty cool. You know, right? H HPE or Dell with all of their platforms <laughs> can't say that. I mean, they still don't have Evolve support for Compellent. Well, right. And so we dropped our, so John Griffith wrote the Docker plugin for us originally, and we dropped that the day before we got acquired. Okay. And then it wasn't even a couple months afterwards that we had the global one for all of NetApp. You know? Um, I must have put the wrong presentation in here. I mean, but we do, like I said, like, you know, you asked 50% of them. Most of my customers, a good number of my customers out there today are, are looking at OpenStack and performance storage in OpenStack. And our integration points across the platform and the space and the spectrum are huge, right? If you look at how we did storage vendor contribution to Cinder, the block storage construct inside OpenStack, there's solid fire up there. I don't know if that says a, yeah. That's 20, uh, 2012, right? Gosh, what have they been doing? What have they been doing? Even NetApp, to a certain extent. And NetApp was very early in the game when it came to integrating with OpenStack, right? They joined in 2011. They were at the Diablo Summit. You know, but we look, and that investment in early spaces where there's not a lot of money and revenue to be had pays off in the end. Because look, today, 21% of production class OpenStack implementations with 1,000 cores or more are running on NetApp. And that's the combination of NetApp and SolidFire. Ceph obviously gets a lot of, you know, because it's free, kind of. We talk to a lot of Ceph customers. There's, <clears throat> there are a very number of good cases for us to have the better together, because Ceph does things really well in certain instances. SolidFire does some other things very well in certain yeah, but instances. Ceph for block storage is free like a puppy. Yeah, well, that's right. It is free like a puppy. But, you know, I've seen, I've seen organizations that have poached entire OpenStack teams to get the Ceph expertise. I've seen organizations that have 20 developers dedicated to keeping it turned on. So, you know, or you can buy some solid fire and it's going to work right out of the box. Um, you know, we look at Cinder and Manila, the two projects. I mean, NetApp's taken a very strong leadership in terms of OpenStack implementation and adoption. You know, we worked with Mirantis to build the Manila stack and then NetApp. And you look at what some of the other people are doing. Oh, so let me tie this real quick and I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up. I wanted to tie back the concepts of DevOps to the world of storage admins and engineers, right? Because here's, here's what I would consider a, an automation process to provision a volume inside a customer's environment. And this is a competitive product. I'm not naming them or beating up on anybody. Just to create a volume, to do thin provisioning, to do deduplication, compression, right? Fractional resource substance. I don't know, by the way, you want some QoS? Because that's a pretty cool feature, isn't it? Sure, let's keep going. All right, create QoS. This is just one volume. Oh, and this is just latency injection. It's nothing special, right? You're, rob you're still gonna have to rob Peter to pay Paul at some point. In my world, I can go to this screen and do that, or I can go to this stanza and do that. And when I go and show this to DevOps engineers or architects or people that are building stuff, they say, I want that, because that's easy. <laughs> and now I can go focus on things that are actually hard, okay? So. Additional resources because knowledge is power, and I love the movie Starship Troopers. Um, like I said, read Phoenix Project and New Kingmakers. Go listen to Goat Farm, New Stack, Arrested DevOps, Changelog. Those guys are sitting around talking to people that are doing this on a daily basis, and they're doing it with very large organizations. Hold on, please. And it's pretty cool. It's cool to hear what they do and the struggles and the challenges that they face on a daily basis, right? So. Anyway, I think that's my time. Um, thanks for having me on board. It's funny, it's taken me, what, six years to come present at Tech Field Day. But I'm here. <laughs>